boldly engaging the mindless propaganda of our time, apparently with reason. This is Rage of the Age. This is Rage of the Age, and we have with us the founder of the Continental Economics Institute. He's the adjunct scholar at the Mises Institute, an honorary member of Mises Brazil. He's professor of economics at the Federal University of Sergipe. He is also the author of Beyond the State and Politics, and he has a revision and new edition of that book coming out soon, as well as a work called Macroeconomics for Business and Finance. I want to introduce to you today, Professor Anthony Mueller. Professor, welcome to the show. Good morning. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I have you here because I read one of your articles called No Privacy, No Property, The World in 2030, According to the WEF. And as I was reading it, I was honestly baffled because I'm thinking in my head, who really believes this? <laughs> and But apparently uh, there's an entire forum, a whole panel, a whole think tank, if you will, that uh, over 50 years now have been kind of shooting towards this direction. and. It really just kind of made me think that this isn't theory for some people. This is stuff that they think is attainable. Um, Why don't you kind of mention some of the things that that was brought up that this uh, the World Economic Forum is wanting to attain by 2030? Well, actually, it surely comes as a surprise for most people. And even for me, it was some kind of a surprising event when I looked at that as the public information uh, uh, at the website of the World Economic Forum. But after a while, I began to study and look around and, and, and investigate. And uh, then I noticed that is that this concept, uh, as the World Economic Forum launches it, stands in a long tradition. And uh, usually when we think abolishment of uh, private property is socialism, communism, that's what you usually think. And then you say, well, this is absolutely crazy. How can anybody after the 20th century still believe that socialism is a viable uh, way to organize, uh, manage a society? But here we have another strand. And this is called uh, expertocracy. It is called a kind of making an administrative state. And in in this uh, 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 direction, uh, uh, you have origins that, of course, go back to Plato with organizing a society not naturally uh, uh, free for the individuals and for the families, but were some wise men, as he called them, philosophers, rule the world. And this, of course, has been tried again and again. One can uh, actually say the so-called nobility felt itself as a kind of uh, persons who were in a certain position to rule the world. So it's no surprise at all. Yes, you have this idea. We are the elected. We are the competent people, that's the original idea of the aristocracy in the original word of being the best. And this, of course, uh, when this uh, feudalism came to an end and, and the power of the aristocracy came to an end, you had the Industrial Revolution, and now you have a new figure. And this figure was rightly named by a person very close to Uh, President Woodrow Wilson, Colonel House, the administrator, the administrator. And of course, uh, now we have administrator to study administration, but we have the top administrator. And this top administrator over the past decades have uh, gained an enormous power, as everybody knows, the names are well known. They are actually kind of royalties, you may say. Yes, in their power, in their power and in their wealth, they are equal to the greatest kings of the past. And of course, with this power, they feel that they are privileged, like being the new aristocracy. 
Now, in this case, uh, the reason to be is not so much from the family, from the uh, uh, being uh, the son of a, of, an, of a king, but due to their own capacity as an expert. So it's an expertocracy that we are talking about. And like you organize a business, where when you are in the business, you are not the, you are not the owner of the things you treat. Yes, you're, you're an employee, but you use the the. You even can go to to eat there. Yeah, maybe the company even has a place for you to sleep and so on. Yes, so it's this kind of non privacy. Yes, you 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 are always in within this organization. And in, in a big company, you go in and, and, and you can have a company car, for example. Yes, but you're personally, like we are used to the individually, you are not the owner. So it has this aspect of socialism, but behind that is a completely different view of the world. <laughs> and of course, it yes. is definitely a different view of the world. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the eight um, predictions from the World Economic Forum that you had listed in your um, article. this So people can uh, listen to what we're talking about here. Th these are eight predictions that they're foreseeing as being the new reality, if you will, uh, economically speaking. People will own nothing. Goods are either free of charge or must be lent from the state. The United States will no longer be the leading superpower, but a handful of countries will dominate. Organs will be transplanted but printed. Meat consumption will be minimized. Massive displacement of people will take place with billions of refugees. To limit the emission of carbon dioxide, a global price will be set at an exorbitant level. People can prepare to go to Mars and start a journey to find alien life. And Western values will be tested to the breaking point. These are some of the things that you had highlighted. Um, is this really what they want to accomplish? Well, it is published in the same form. I did not exaggerate what, what I found there. And uh, they even, uh, the, the, when I talk, they, they, it's the World Economic Forum, they launched a video. Uh, it, it, it was down for some time, interestingly enough, but it <laughs> reappeared, uh, strangely enough. These things are very, very strange sometimes. Yeah. And uh, so they even have a, a with a nice guy, a, a very uh, sympathetic guy who who, who uh, preaches these these ideas. And they are not so absurd as they seem when you think about uh, of uh, turning the world into a group of mega corporations. Yes. And this mega corporation, you can still call them the European Union. Yes, or right. or Northern America or something like that. Right. Yes, but it is a new idea where, of course, and this is the World Economic Forum, you have a, a very intimate interaction between government, politicians, and business people. Yeah, public-private uh, cooperation, very strong. So you have already or still elements of what we are used to be politics and so on. Maybe you even have elections. Yes, with a true or false, another question, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> because they can manipulate anything. That, that's the point. I mean, when in, in, in this new electronic age, when we really have these super organizations, the mm -hmm. people at the top can practically manipulate anything. They can, they can censure without having a censorship. Officially, they just uh, put you down. Uh, eliminate your your contribution and so switch you off. You don't need to burn books anymore. Mm. You don't need to burn books anymore. You right. just they just close your account, so you're out. Yes, and um, so it's a it's a horrible vision for a person who loves individual liberty. Yes, I mean it's already a horror uh, to work in a big corporation. Yes, if you are if you're in this <laughs> employment situation, uh, you suffer in a certain way and you're happy to go out, yes, uh, and mm -hmm. you have your spare time and, and to have your holidays, uh, you have your family, you can recover from that. But now imagine, yes, you are an employee, yeah, 24 hours, yeah, in this mega corporation that's called your 
country, which is mm. no longer called a country, which has come out of Europe. Union, well, a good example could be, in fact, the European Union, where you can't even uh, identify individual countries specifically mm -hmm. anymore. The th that's what struck me to my core was, is this dream that they have totally eliminates a lot of just individual liberties. You, they're going to force you to move basically where they say billions of people will be forcibly relocated somewhere to fit this apparatus that they want to run a certain way they're going to limit how much meat you eat so they're, they're telling you what to eat what not to eat um organs will be transplant but the printed organs and you you went on into this further in your article about this idea of selling the idea of uh immortality right there no one will own anything everything's free but it's a service right um uh, western values one of the best values that we value is liberty. That is definitely going to be tested to the breaking point if it won't break under such a system. Um, to prepare to go to Mars and find alien life, because that's <laughs> okay. Uh, limiting carbon emissions, it seems like the real God here is the creation itself, not the creator. And this obsession over not having fields of animals on it, but just letting nature run amok, it's <laughs> where's the liberty? And of course, you asked the question, why would someone sign up for something like this? So wh why do you think that's so appealing? Well, and uh, just, just think about uh, a corporation, what's called the perks. When you join a corporation, for example, you get uh, in many, for many corporations, free health care as a mm -hmm. package. You get a car, you get probably subsidized housing and so on. Yes, and you have uh, subsidized food in the company and so on. And uh, it would work in the same way. Uh, people would get invited. They have a perfect healthcare system. Uh, they have uh, the chance uh, to even uh, move to the Mars in the future, all done by this mega, big, uh, super uh, uh, efficient corporation. You have a vision for the, for the future. And of course, it's now packaged uh, with the ideology of our time, which is saving the planet, which is saving mm. the earth, which is climate protection, which has been uh, going on as the gospel uh, for, yes, more than 50 years. Now it started in the 70s with a Club of Rome uh, 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 publications of, of, of limits to growth. And from there, it has been going on. And uh, you have all this kind of, uh, uh, like it's, 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 it has religion, religious aspects in this yes. sense, ca because religion work uh, with heaven and hell. Yes. And so if you join us, uh, we can promise you a kind of paradise. And if you don't follow, the world will go uh, to, to nothing. And you, we will have to, we will destroy the planet. The, 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 the sea levels will rise. The sun will scorch everything. There will no longer be survival and so on. Yes. And as to the movement of people, you have that in any corporation. Uh, uh, you're getting allotted uh, to a new uh, activity, to a new factory, to a new uh, uh, branch of, 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 of the bank or, or of the a factory and so all fits uh, uh, to understand that one has to think the world uh, being administrated like the big mega corporation in the tradition mm -hmm. that grew particularly with Taylorism and with with the Sloan the Sloan management idea Ford Corporation uh, uh, where, where 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 is the the origin and the idea behind everything is efficiency. No, now liberty, uh, not liberty, but, but efficiency. Yes, and uh, well, and you pay the price with individual liberty, which for, sorry enough to say, for many people is an, yes, uh, somewhat an easy trade-off. You gain security as a false promise. Yes, you gain safety, you get, you can, they even promise you implicitly 
you can expect eternal life. It's very, it's very amazing if you think about that. Right. Yes, if you right. just jump on that. And emotionally, uh, the world has been prepared by the same, yes, groups or, yes, the same. Uh, it's like forming a communist party in the past. Now we form a kind of Club of Rome movement, yes. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. launch their books like, like the communists have launched their books. And they find followers, and they infiltrate the mass media. And now, mm -hmm. uh, wherever you look, the climate uh, 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 idea is is the, really has religious status. And you are an heretic when you utter any small doubt. Yes, like mm -hmm. ironically, I, I already uh, have met uh, a strong uh, uh, resistance. How can you say that? Yes, just in discussions, I said, well, uh, since I live in Brazil now uh, for the past 20 years, I, live, I have lived for 20 years close to the sea, always at the shore, and I haven't mm -hmm. seen one centimeter or inch of, <laughs> of, of rising sea level. Yes. And, and, and how dare you how say that? You, how dare I, <laughs> I think at least one centimeter or inch would be well, something right. I would think about. But I haven't even noticed that. And then they come up with crazy ideas like, well, mm -hmm. maybe not where you live, as if the world seas were not connected. So they think right. that the sea level can rise. <laughs> that shows the stupidity of these guys. Yes. Now, yes. one once said he saw a movie where, where an island was uh, threatened by rising sea level. I said, well, mm. OK. Uh, this island has been thinking that has been going on all over the world <laughs> that, 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 that the tectonic movements uh, happen <laughs> and small islands right. sink. So this guy really thought that was a proof that the sea level were rising because some one were or some people were talking about that our island is is uh, 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 flooded yeah. by by ever higher. Uh, so it is stupidity. It's absolute stupidity on the side of the climate freaks. And, but it's a rational discussion is impossible. You cannot talk rational. It's like like uh, values. Yes, it's like uh, uh, convictions. Yes. Yeah. And and yeah. and and the worst of all is, and this is that has become dangerous, because for example, in in my home home country in in Germany, yes, the Green Party, not just there, but very very clearly, has now entered many, many positions of government. They are, mm. they are holders of power. Yes, the politics uses the state as an instrument yeah, for the ideology. Now they are in a powerful position. They have gained power, real power. Yes, and they are yeah. blinded uh, even more so when they have power uh, uh, in their ideology. So it has become nothing to, to laugh about. It is a very serious situation. <laughs> Blind, I think, is a good illustration. But it, well, like the, the island example that you gave, if an island is, you know, if the water is rising there, I would think that water would be rising everywhere. Of course. But they're trying yes. to say, no, here, but not there. It's like in the bathtub, water only rose on that side, but not on my, <laughs> not on this side. Sort of. example, it's yeah, like, yeah. how does that work? Yes. But like you said, you can explain it a hundred times, and still the the dogma will just kick in, and a, re, a refusal to hear. But I, uh, you were mentioning a, an Ada or an Ida Alkin, I believe is how yes, you say yes. it, the, the Dane. Yes. Uh, <sighs> She was talking about the winning the war on climate change. I mean, that almost seems to be it's either the primary objective or it's the primary tool or both. I'm not sure, but that seems to be one of the the forces of leverage that's being used to accomplish this goal. Certainly, it 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 is a a a, a temptation that has been going on to find an emotion. Yes, uh, political movements need an emotion. And now uh, there have been many spiritually uh, spiritual emotions in the past. Uh, even the hum hum humanism, the humanitarian issue was was a an emotional aspect. Yes, or justice, justice. Yes, 
But right. uh, so all these things have been in discussion. Uh, one talks about the justice warriors in, 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 in right. the US and so on. But what really caught on uh, uh, was the climate thing, yes. Uh, crazy enough as it is, yes, even it has a little uh, substance. Uh, and behind that were, of course, uh, besides this uh, yes, uh, expertocracy movement, yes, uh, to fund science. The Rockefeller Foundation is very instrumental. I mean, uh, I lived in, in academia most of my life, and I know that uh, academics are as corrupt when there's high amounts of money involved. And you have that right. in climate uh, uh, science. They call it climate science now to give it an mm -hmm. extra. But what they actually do in climate science is modeling. Yes, and as an economist, I know what modeling is. So I can talk about it and I know how problematic it is. It's the same thing that caught my attention uh, about the modeling when this virus thing came up from the uh, British Im Imperial College. Yes, where the, the, they modeled, yes, uh, the pandemic and, and uh, made this prognosis of horrible casualties. And I had a quick look at the at the at the model and could see the errors as I as I uh, was used to it from the economics area where you can right. where you can see very much and very quickly that that the substance is lacking that it's it's a pseudoscience it's a pseudoscience but because it is quantitative and because it's very linked to computer and it has many variables and, and so on. It, it has the appearance, the clad of science, but it is not science in the true sense as the old climatology, climatology was, the teaching about the climate. There's a long tradition with solid knowledge and it's a serious science. Now they, they turn that into climate science, which is basically modeling, assumptions and modeling. And you can do anything. You can please the 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 uh, who who will buy uh, your product. You can please mm. them. That's the point. A little yes. bit twitch and, and tweak and so on, and it gets the right results. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. I think it has all the errors and the variables of sophistry. Yes. You present yes. something yes. that looks sophistry. real. It looks like it's legit. Yes. You have these great sounding arguments, but oh, the substance is, is just missing. You, you've lived in Brazil, you said, about 20 yes, years? Yes, yes, yes. Now, I, I remember from decades ago, the big emotional point here in the States was all the slashing and burning going on in Brazil and the oxygen is going to get sucked up and all the trees are going to disappear and we're all going to die. Has that happened there since you've well, seen that, that? That's another uh, great uh, mythology. First of all, uh, people usually uh, have no idea about the size of the Amazon. Yes. Uh, yeah. And also, yeah, and huge. also from even from the perspective, uh, not just of Europeans, but uh, where 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 all countries are small in Europe, yes, except of Russia, yes, uh, and they have no vision of the size of a country like Brazil. But even for Americans, I would I would guess that few Americans know that Brazil has the size of the United States without Alaska. So. When you think about a large part of that is the Amazon, a lot, very large part of that. Just imagine more or less uh, two-fifths of the United States are Amazon uh, wow. to, to compare. Yes, and it's sparsely populated, sparsely populated. And of course, you can make impressive pictures, yes, L like the burning mm. in, in wood burning and, and, and so on and the, the, in, in California. Yes, and you have the impression that whole California is, is going to waste because you just, you just <laughs> film a small part of that. Yes, and, right. and, and nothing of that and even all these ideas that it is the lung of the world. Uh, I studied that and I asked expert about that. 
is absolutely false. It's one of these typical myths that that have been going on for for a long time, and and they come up every year. Yes, and th th this is a natural part. It's a natural process because of 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 thunder, thunderstorms, and <clears throat> uh, uh, lightning, uh, where some parts uh, burn. It has going on in the history throughout. And uh, you have many other places in the world where it is also happening in Africa, in the jungles of Africa, in, in, in Asia, and so on. Yes, and it, it, it is in the, in the very interest of the Brazilians to maintain the, the Amazonian region as a wood region, because there yeah. the atmosphere gets uh, up with, with air and, 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 and water, which then flows down to the southern part where the agricultural area is. So the, this, the Amazon sucks, so to speak, air and water, puts it into water, and the wind brings down the rain to the fields that are south of the Amazon. So it would be absolutely yes. crazy to, 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 to do it away. And as I said, the, the country is big, and there's still so much place to, to do agriculture. Yes, anywhere else. Yes, just where I live. I, if I go in 20 kilometers, you could find uh, uh, agricultural land without end, which is just not cultivated because there's so, still so much around. So it's, it's one of right. these examples where the world opinion, so they call the, the newspaper reader, in fact, is more stupid than the ordinary people who does not read at all this stuff. And does not care about. That's that's uh, really we have this yeah. this, this disinformation uh, nowadays, which right. is very extreme in in many aspects. Right, because I, I I'm just thinking through my head all the things I've heard over my lifetime of what we are going to die by. You know, when when I was a child, it was there's going to be a new. Ice I know. Age. Yes, I remember. We're all, we're all going to freeze out. That's just a few days. Exactly. Ago, right, and and then there was there was the acid rain. Right. I'm supposed yes. to just, you know, melt yes, us all yes, to pieces yes. unless we do something about it. Yeah. You had the, the hole in the ozone used to be big in the news. I, they act like it got patched or something because you don't hear about it hardly as much. And then it was the, the, the global warming, uh, but then it got changed to climate change. And it's just, it's like they reinvent a new crisis every few years, every decade and just run with it. And everybody forgets. Well, what about the other things you predicted to, to fuel the direction you're going in? And it, it, that's why I think it's more of a leverage than it is uh, a legitimate concern. Well, it's, it's just a, a way to compel something. It's an instrument to rule. I mean, uh, to scare people is a common instrument, and it works uh, usually even better than to offer uh, some carrot. Yes, the stick is more, uh, if, if with kids, a stick works better than the carrot. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and yeah, for yeah. people who don't, uh, yeah. who don't look through the things, the, the, the imminence of the stick is very present, while the uh, carrot is more abstract for most people. And it works. Yeah, it absolutely. definitely works. No government can do without yeah. this stick. Now, from an economic perspective, because that, that's like your, your Zen area there, the, <laughs> how do they justify the viability of this economic process? Because, I mean, I, I'm not trained to be an economist, but, I mean, I understand basic principles. Um, how is this going to work? I, and you said they have models, but, you know, anybody can make a model and just put the information they want in it and say, look, it works. But, I mean, we, like, like for some, some examples you gave about from Ida again, you know, that uh, uh, more there'll be less buying of goods, but more use of services. M money will vanish and uh, work time will shrink and leisure will grow. Um, it, how? It, it, <laughs> there, you've limited the expression of personal desire to drive a market. You get what the government tells you to get. And it's and it's, apparently it's so few in sir or in goods that even your food is limited on what you get. Your house is limited on what you get. Oh, and by the way, you know, this day of the week, this company is using your bedroom or whatever. Yes. Thing, right. Like nothing's yes. li nothing's literally yes. yours. Oh, but they compensate with you get all these services. Who's providing these services if nobody's working? Yeah. 
I mean, there's there's no inter, there's no interaction of people to f- make an economy go. Do do economists really buy this, or is this just a power grab? I mean, that, that's yes, not- uh, very very well put. I like how you told that because it 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 uh, uh, came up to me this idea that we all live in a yellow submarine. <laughs> We're on a submarine and we join. The, the bed together while you are out and, and uh, doing yeah, it, yeah, I can yeah. sleep and so on. <laughs> and we have the food all present and, 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 and uh, we have a commander who tells us what to do and everybody has his uh, 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 task to fulfill. So, of course, they, mm-hmm. they think you would work, yes, but you would work like in a company or on a submarine and you have your certain functions and you have your qualification. And you can get educated, and uh, well, and this is my my critique, just as you uh, agree also, uh, that it won't and it can't work. It can't work because we already know that even the size of companies as we have them now is limited because it's well studied. Yes. As the bigger your company gets, the more the so-called transaction costs rise. And there's yes. a limit to that. Yes. That there, there, there are classic parts of the literature, and even Nobel prizes and and so on were given to that. That why do we have markets? Exactly, we have markets because we cannot organize everything. And well, sometimes markets are too. They have also their own kind of transaction costs. I cannot negotiate yes. every time. Uh, uh, will I uh, work this or that? So we make a contract, and for some time I'm in a stable corporate position. So this is a sense, and the market has sense. I mean, th- this is uh, the, the functioning. And so we have contracts on one side, uh, long, longer term contracts, working contracts with certain definition of work that we can change. But Beyond that, the, the, the rest is very strongly uh, uh, managed uh, implicitly by markets and prices. And without markets and prices, which also big corporations have learned that they have to introduce markets and prices into their own companies, it won't work. Yes. And so after, yeah. after a while, uh, uh, this project won't go anywhere. I, I'm sure about that. But when they do it, when they, the World Economic Forum, all that, that's, that's united with it, and the politicians at their side, not to, to, to forget, we have idiotic politicians who cooperate with that. <laughs> all this green movement is very strongly behind right. that. So they have power. They can implement this idea. Yes. And, yes. and uh, what happened in 2020 just gave us a foretaste. And now uh, right. it can't work, it won't work, but learning that is a horrible experience for large parts of the world. It's like a repetition of the disaster that had, was done uh, creating the Soviet Union. Yes, when, when, when right. the uh, a, a gigantic disaster happened. And interesting enough, now it, uh, I, I remember, uh, there was there's a sentence by 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 Lenin, yes. What is Soviet economy? And he answered, "It's one big factory." So they have this mm. same idea, and and when yes. when when Lenin was already he had a stroke uh, and 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 continued to live in in a half state in in the in his dacha when when the power uh, went to to Stalin, but he was still. Uh, uh, the the head of the United uh, the, of, of 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 Soviet Union. So he his, he painted all kinds of of skyscrapers, mega machines. He he was he was also a, a type of an of an ex, ex, expertocracy follower. Yes, of creating right. a new state, uh, a, a, a very modern economy. Uh, efficiency was very uh, was very at, at the at the nature. Of the Soviet project, because one should not forget the big promise of the communism was we will be more prosperous under than under right. capitalism. The workers will have a better life because we are more efficient. 
That was the big problem. Right. Uh, pro and because they il eliminated private property, and because they eliminated in this process uh, markets and prices, the opposite happened. And this is also the case right. with this project, which will end in a terrible disaster if it should go on. You, again, we have historical precedents to show over and over again yeah. <laughs> that, that this is a bad way to go, yet they persist in it, which again brings me back to, well, in a point you brought up as well, but you were talking about the expertocracies, the administrative state, the you know, the, this idea that these certain elites rule, wh whatever the criteria is that makes them qualified. They know what's best for everybody. They're going to rule and they're going to make everything kind of kick into place. Uh, an idea in my head was when uh, Rome became uh, an empire and basically the emperor ensured the tranquility of the whole empire, which eventually helped drive down its productivity. But that's the question. And, and you asked that question, too, in your article. Who, who will be the rulers? Who's going to be the powers that be that tell you where you're going to live, what you're going to eat, what you're going to own or not? Well, you don't own it. What they will allow you to possess by their grace and their grace alone. Um, who gets to decide that? Has they, have they been kind of forthcoming with that information or is that something kind of just hinted at? Well, it, it they, they have to come back to this idea of the corporation who gets to the top. And in the, in the corporate world, you have certain criteria uh, to come uh, to the top, how you manage your department and so on. It's the efficiency criteria. But what they mm -hmm. leave out is that the final check of whether a company is successful or not is a subjective valuation of the consumer. That is the final criteria. And if this is gone, yes. I mean, the whole thing breaks down. Uh, you cannot be efficient for what? Yes. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and they totally leave yeah. out this idea that Hayek used to stress very much. Yes, that we have to incorporate in this whole idea of the economy of politics, that each individual has a subjective evalu evaluation of things. And uh, of course, uh, uh, now you have this other implication that when, we when you leave that out, you have to make all persons equal. Yes, it's another horrible, uh, uh, you have to have right. sort of thing. It, it was an idea already that came up under Maoism. Why have a choice of, a hundred different types of suits. One suit is enough for everybody. So change uh, the size. <laughs> right. Yes. And, and right. I mean, right. it has some kind of efficiency concept behind that. But it's the same uh, when you when you go on. Uh, what is the sense of life? Yes. I mean, uh, uh, we are <clears> here <throat> not just to be efficient. Uh, th this is this is the illusion <laughs> that is behind. I mean. Right. Who, who, who can right. be efficient 24 hours? I mean, we are here also to have to do some crazy things and, and cry like crazy when there is a sports event or something like that. Yes. Or, or when you're young, you, you uh, run or, or ride uh, 200 kilometers to find your lover or so on. It's all crazy. Yes. But it's is human life. And you, mm -hmm. if you, if you put on, uh, categories of efficiency in this sense you always have to ask for what efficient for what yes because the final point is subjective is is a value is an individual right. value a right. personal value that is yes uh, right. so this whole apparatus of a corporation of a state of a society is not the sense is not the society in it the, the value is not the society is not the state the corporation is not the sense but the meaning is how it serves individuals, individuals in their immense variety and differences and craziness and so on. Yes, and uh, so it, it is, it is a, a perversion, yes, uh, that is going mm -hmm. on, which mm -hmm. is not, which, not, which does not come out of nowhere. I mean, one has to take into account that at, at the top of these mega corporations are guys 
not usually the original founder, surely not Steve Jobs in this kind, yeah, but to follow them. Yes, right. these are careerists. I mean, these are guys that were efficient in school, that were efficient at right. the university. They were efficient when right. they entered uh, the corporate world. They were efficient climbing the ladder. And when they are top, their whole life looking back was, a, was efficiency. Efficiency within what it was given to them. Yes, the teachers that you have to yes. study that. You have to get the, this grade. The, the professors that you have to get this grade and so on. Then you're in business school and so on. So they are at the top and their whole world is formed by this. They, many of them uh, have not a big private life, for example. Yes, and okay, right. they, they, when they're at the top, they, they have their big toys now. But one can see they use these big toys without much uh, enjoyment. Yes, it's just, it's also mm -hmm. prestige. Yes. It's also prestige. Yes. Well, yeah, definitely yes. prestige too. The, <laughs> I can, st I'm still thinking though about your comment about the, uh, where, where they wanted you have one outfit yeah. in China. Like, you know, that's efficient. Just make one. Everybody has it. Problem solved. Right. But, uh, I, I mean, I, I see videos now and I don't see people in China wearing one outfit. Well, anymore. You know what I'm saying? So, so obviously the idea didn't carry on for, for two. There, there's things in China, honestly, that I think have deviated from the, uh, if I can say it, not be condemned, the, the communist ideal. <laughs> they, they've deviated many ways because they, they're, even though they won't openly admit it, they're seeing that they're having issues making things fit in certain ways. So they kind of craftily word stuff and rearrange things. But I mean, that, that example in itself shows that, okay, yeah, one, one outfit, eh, that sounds efficient, but uh, who wants to wear that one outfit for the rest of their life? I mean, <laughs> they went away from it because, you know, the efficiency doesn't matter in that regard. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, Anthony, it's been awesome talking with you today. This is uh, apparently this isn't something that's going to go away. And this is something that we need to pay more attention to, I think. Uh, the, the article was No Privacy, No Property of the World in 2030, according to the WEF, the Mises Institute. You can find that online. Uh, Google that. It'll come right up. You can read it. There, I think there's an audio version you can listen to. Um, uh, remember, the book's coming out, re, uh, revised a new edition of Beyond the State and Politics and the work of microeconomics for, or macroeconomics for business and finance to be released soon from Anthony Mueller. Anthony, thank you awesome so having. much. It's been great talking to you. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. Welcome to the essay segment. First off, I just want to express how much of a joy it was talking with uh, Professor Anthony Mueller uh, regarding the World Economic Forum and some of the... Uh, I'm going to say twisted visions that they have for the future and uh, the, the, you know, whether that's even viable uh, and whether it's viable or not, doesn't mean it won't be attempted. And that's the dangerous thing. And we're just going to do it regardless attitude. It's really getting old in a lot of things. Uh, change just for the sake of change is uh, really getting old just the same. Uh, you know, we should apply a little bit more scrutiny, you know, when we start talking about taking away things that belongs to people, you know, their, their personal property. Thinking about our discussion and uh, and through some other things, it uh, made something pop in my mind. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I do like to study is uh, military history. And I have the personal opinion that military historians are probably more honest historians than, than at least the historians we probably have now. Um, and, and the reason I say that is, is if you look at the typical history book you're going to read now, it's all laced with intersectionality, and it's all laced with this idea of oppression. It's a Marxist viewpoint. It's cherry-picking history very horribly in order to reach their uh, political uh, paradigms that they kind of want to emphasize, and they use, you know, borrow whatever parts of history they want to kind of back up, you know, what they want to be true. And then they ignore everything else surrounded about it. I don't think that's an honest history. Uh, Good, bad, or ugly, you have to record it for what it is. That's how I view 
how we should study history. Uh, but with military history, you're more uh, cause and effect oriented. You're not concerned about uh, the political paradigms and whether which one's right or wrong. You're considered about, you know, why was this army a good army? Why was this army a bad army? And you look at their training, you look at their leadership, you look at uh, how soldiers were um, gathered and, you know, how they viewed the service. You look at the logistics and 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 then as an attachment, you look at like the society they're from. What was, how was their society organized? What type of government was it? Did the politics and the government interfere with the military activity and so on? And you look at all these factors and and how it affects the, the military situation. And it's a different way of looking at history, I think. But again, you look more at facts and cause and effect. It allows someone like, say, for myself, um, I absolutely despise communism and, and I hate it. And, and same with socialism. You, you can't make it look any prettier just because you use it, you know, put the word democratic in front of it. it it's ugly to me. It's ugly to me uh, because of the history behind it, but also just when you look at the economic principles, it's absolutely insanity. And, and to me, that should just close the matter, but nonetheless, you will have stubborn people that will do it regardless of their model just not being correct. You know, I, I also, I just, and, and in addition, I don't like totalitarian regimes, period. So I have a huge dislike, you know, for like fascist regimes, uh, you know, like for um, Italy or uh, Germany, for example, which are probably the two most well-known ones. Uh, but to, to me, though, as a military historian, I can take an event like, say, the fighting on the Eastern Front, and I can analyze and look at armies of two systems that I really don't like, but analyze it honestly for the military uh, knowledge that you get from it. I can look at the German army, the Wehrmacht, uh, in World War II at the Eastern Front, and I can study it and look at its tactics, look at the training, look at how the army had changed over time from being on that front, uh, the interference from the politics from higher, like from the Fuhrer, uh, interfering, and you know, and and look at the military aspect without glorifying who Germany was. And on the same token, I can look at the Red Army, someone I hate just the same, and analyze what their army was like, and you know how the soldiers were treated and and massed together, and the tactics they used and how the politics and the economy affected that military. And, and, and I look at those and I can look at two entities that I would never back, but yet understand them and, and come to grips with it and, and, and look at, you know, whether you like who they were or not, you can look at both those militaries and have a little bit of respect for what they've accomplished as well as look at some of the things they did and go, what was wrong with you, right? That, that's an honest appreciation of history. But not long ago, I was re revisiting and re-looking at uh, the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan, uh, primarily in the 80s, where the army, the, the uh, Soviet Union had an army there in Afghanistan, um, you know, trying to basically make it a communist buffer state and um, I was coming across some reports um, about their military, some analysis about the, mil the Soviet military that was in Afghanistan. And there was a very huge problem with soldiers selling off stuff to the, the black market and even directly to the enemy. Now, when I say, you know, the, the stuff, these items, I'm talking about military equipment, you know, uh, it could be as simple as their uniforms, uh, but it can also mean, um, you know, their weapons, ammunition, uh, entire military vehicles have been sold off, right? And now from a strictly military perspective and, and having done 20 years of service myself, when, when I see that and that it was rampant, that this, it wasn't like a few guys who did this in secret on the side, this was like open season this is happening all the time. Militarily speaking, that's a 
bad situation for an army to be in. That shows an absolute lack of discipline, a lack of efficiency. It shows that the officer of the Corps doesn't have control of the troops. And it shows that the army is not united in the effort. And, and there's just a lot of things wrong with that. I couldn't imagine, for example, uh, a, a typical com you know, a U.S. unit selling off stuff at that rate and doing it openly. I, I mean, that would just be frowned upon by those around them to begin with, and especially if you know it's going to the enemy. right? That's just unthinkable in our heads, but it was very thinkable to them. Now, I came across an explanation, though, as to why that was the case, because I'm immediately criticizing and, you know, condemning that army in Afghanistan. Like, that's absolutely horrendous. How are you going to win that military contest with an army like that? But the way it was explained to me really caught me off guard. It, it did. And here's what it is. They were obviously selling that stuff because they wanted to get other goods that they normally don't have. And it's not like they just started doing that in Afghanistan. This was the way they grew up in the Soviet Union. Why? Again, you have limited goods provided to you from the Soviet economy. It was supposed to be no economy but this system and what the government gives you. But because it didn't provide much, and it was always lacking... It was a common practice in the Soviet Union, not even in the army, but just in the Soviet Union period, where people would just, anything they can get from the government, they would then sell it off on some kind of side market in order to get something that they, you know, need or want. It's, it's a very telling thing that in, in 1980s in Afghanistan, the people in Afghanistan, many of them still living under tribal systems, by the way, had the ability to get goods and things they wanted easier than your average citizen in the Soviet Union. Now, you think about that, all right? They looked at the Afghan society as feudal and medieval, oppressed, and all the typical language that the communists love to throw out there. Yet those people could <laughs> were able to have more food, and more goods, and enjoy more things than your average Soviet citizen. Uh, you know, the only exception would be like, you know, they had health care and education, the typical selling points now. But when it came down to actually getting things you wanted, who had more buying power? Well, in the Soviet system, you weren't supposed to have much buying power. It's very limited, and the government limited what you got. So when that army got to Afghanistan and was using is selling off whatever you know they can get from the government to actually get the things that they want to to include drugs for not wanting to be there hashish was common use it shows you one of the inherent evils of a type of economic system that refuses to let you have private property refuses you to own your own things that you can only get what this higher entity gives you to live off of, and you're just, and then just enjoy it. That's the sort of the idea it is, and and that's no different from what the World Economic Forum offers, uh, other than the claim that it might actually work this time. But you're still only going to get. I mean, think about it, y'all. You, you you're limited on the meat you eat. So you know what that means. Uh, no more uh, Texas Roadhouse, right? You, you you're not going to go to the the Ponderosa and the buffets and. And uh, restaurants might even be just eliminated altogether. I mean, you know, reduce the carbon footprint, right? So if you want a steak and then the government's like, hey, uh, you got six ounces for the month, you know, whatever, we're cutting down on it. What, what do you think is going to happen? You know, I'm going to find my vegetarian friends and I'm going to like, hey, I got some extra broccoli and cauliflower that I don't want to eat. And I know you don't want that steak. Let's trade. You know what that is? That's a side market. The very thing it tries to repress, people will naturally try to reinvent to make happen. And, and this is the insanity of this, of this thinking. In the, in the Soviet Union, it was tried, and in that system, people were using what the government gave them and still created markets on the side to do commerce with one another. Because in the end, that's what economy is. It, it really comes down to 
how people interact with goods and services. That, that's it. The, the state can come in all handy, have it handed as it wants. But in the end, economy is simply how everybody interacts with one another for their goods and services. And it was in, in Afghanistan with the soldiers that they had there, they were simply showing what their system was like. I mean, it's strange. <laughs> These Soviet soldiers, and of course, the higher ranks would abuse their, their rank, you know, so much for, you know, equality and, and all that other stuff that they always preach. But they had a hierarchy of rank with privileges, which is no society that claims to be totally free of hierarchy ever makes it. And of course, those who are in the party and the elites, well, they get better treatment than everybody else. But nonetheless, soldiers would go to the markets in Kabul in Afghanistan to get things that they could not get in the Soviet Union. Again, this is a society that in the Soviet Union they criticized as backward, as medieval, as, you know, oppressive and, and, and everything wrong, you know, all the typical Soviet lang uh, communist language, right? That we were better than they are, but you still had to use their markets, <laughs> right? They would go to the markets to buy the blue, uh, American blue jeans, to get a, a working TV, to get a, a radio, to get a nice watch. All the things that they were starved of in their system, they had to go to the markets of Kabul, where the people were supposedly, you know, oppressed and backwater people to buy their stuff that they couldn't get back home. Let that sink in. Now, we have a multitude of examples of why this type of economy is absolutely horrendous and harmful and just plainly doesn't work. If we allow this to take root, especially on a global scale, because now you can't escape from it like you could before, right? People would defect to the United States all the time to escape communist regimes. But imagine if you had nowhere to go, right? Because that's their goal. You, you can't have the antithesis to what they got going on. But imagine putting that in place, fully knowing we know it's going to fail. But you do it anyway. That makes you a certain sort of person to me in my head. It's like, you're just so determined to destroy something just for the sake of destroying it. And, and you have nothing to offer, but oh, you don't care. You're just going to destroy it. I see you as a very hateful and destructive person, really. That, that, that's how I see it. Uh, and, and if there's an emotional tag to it, it's just they played you for your emotion, and they're using you. You, you haven't thought through what the consequences are going to be in adapting these systems. Absolutely maddening. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter if it works or not. It's the fact that they're going to try it, and there's going to be enough people who are determined to give it a try, despite the constant lessons we have learned over and over again. We have really got to get better on how we think. You've been listening to Rage of the Age. If you love today's podcast, make sure to leave a review on the media you're listening through. Secure future episodes by heading over to rageoftheage.com and clicking the RSS feed button. Until next time, this has been Rage of the Age.